Hi, my name is Leighton Jin. I'm the Director of Development for the American Documentary and Animation Film Festival, also known as Andox, which is March 21st to 25th. Today, I'm very excited because uh, we have Sophia Songhai, and she directed and produced Interception, the Jane Kennedy American Sportscaster. And I was telling her before we went live that uh, I remember watching Jane Kennedy. I thought she did a terrific mm -hmm. job on uh, the uh, CBS pregame show. NFL today, right? Yes, that's where she just appeared this past Sunday, which is we're obviously shooting this in February, but yeah, it was earlier this week. She returned to the desk of the uh, CBS NFL today uh, after 44 years <sighs> of absence. Yes. <laughs> so, so, so let's start with this. How did you uh, come across Jane and was it something you pursued for documentary or did, did you happen to Run across, but what is the genesis of this documentary? Sure. So, um, years ago, I actually wanted to just make a film about Jane Kennedy, the actress, and about the um, beauty pageant uh, winner. She's one of the first women, African American women, to ever compete in the Miss USA competition, and she's the first Miss Black. Um, or she's either she's the first Black Miss Ohio. <laughs> so she's the first <laughs> Black Miss Ohio in the Miss USA competition. And she is, I think, the second woman to ever compete in Miss USA. And she was number four in, in the top 10 that year that she competed, I believe it was 1970. And so I just was really interested in that. And then there was a grant from the Arizona State, Arizona State University, uh, a film about sports. And I promise you, I knew nothing about sports. Like, I mean, I was not the person to even respond to this grant at all. And I was like, like, well, you know, and I started thinking about Melissa Ford. And I was like, well, you know, I wonder who the first black woman to ever be a sportscaster because I, you know, there are a few and there are definitely some people who are very prominent. I was like, I wonder who the first one was. And I thought it was like someone like Robin Roberts or something like that. And then when I looked it up, it was also Jane Kennedy. And I was like, wait a minute, this is the same, you know, so I, I, I knew her as the actress and as a spokesmodel and all of that. But I did not know that this, yeah, you know, I just wasn't alive at the time that all of these things happened. And <laughs> also, I just didn't know this. I didn't know the chronology exactly. I just knew that she was a big deal, like Pam Greer during the black exploitation era and all of that. And I knew that she, you know, had launched her career as a as a pageant contestant and then turned it into an acting modeling spokesperson career before she sort of retired all of that to, you know, have a family and have kids and all and and pursue other interests in life. But when I found out that she was the first black woman sportscaster, I reached out to a few people. I'm like, I gotta get her on the phone because there's this grant and I would love to know what her experience was like. And I thought that everything was going to be really positive and wonderful. And you know, she got the job and it was just green lights from there. But on the phone call, the first phone call that we had, it was five hours long. Wow. And every time I thought that she was in the clear, she was like, and then this happened. And this happened. I was like, oh my God. Like I was just like, I was taking notes feverishly. It was a five hour call. And I had, you know, a legal pad worth of notes. And I was just like, I, at the end of the call, I just was so devastated for her about all the tumultuous stuff that she had gone through and, and, and how devastating it was because I was an anchor woman and a news reporter and I'd worked in TV my entire adult life as on-air talent. And many of the things that she went through, I also had gone through, but certainly not as the first person to go through those things. <laughs> there's a big <laughs> difference when you don't have anyone to ask and there's no one that is your predecessor. You know, you, you've never had anyone, um, or rather you are there. Yeah, there's, you don't have anyone that has come before you to ask mm -hmm. their advice. And she's the first one in the entire history of a country that had just ended Jim Crow. They had mm -hmm. just ended segregated everything, schools, you know, buses, lunch counters, water fountains, all of this. And she is a part of that baby boomer generation to then see what this new America is like. What is this new America like? Is this law good? Is the ink dry? You know, are we about to get a fair shot? And there's a movement in television to then illustrate what a new America could be like with black people being, you know, being given like some sort of balanced um, recognition in sick, you know, in sitcoms like the Norman Lear sitcoms and all of that, all those different television shows emerged in the 1960s and 70s. And this was a part of that, you know, her, her inclusion in television was a part of this movement to give a different picture of what America could be, but what it was behind the scenes was still the, uh, suffering from the vestiges of Jim Crow and even the slavery era. I mean, every other era before 1968, 69, when the civil rights acts are passed, now, you know, they've 
been many of them have been repealed as of last year. And so, you know, this era of time, they had they were the first people up at bat, you know, to uh, to see what this country was going to look like. And they were going to paint that picture with their lives. And she's one of those people who did. Right. And then, I mean, I just feel it's so important to kind of tell the story when you're the first and you're in your uh, uh, blazing a trail for for people because. You know, you take a look at what sports reporting was back then to what it is now. It's a tremendous change. And she was the start of that change. I mean, obviously, we hope it goes further. But um, did Jane ever talk to you about where, how it started for her, where it's, what it's become today for uh, journal, uh, sports journals? But let's also uh, specifically talk about uh, sports, uh, female sports journals of color as well, because that's, there's a challenges with that as well. Exactly. So, um, so Jane actually comes from a really big sports family and she was an athlete herself and she's very, very tall. She's a uh, 5'10", 5'11". So she plays a lot of sports very well. I think, I think she played uh, track and field. I know she played track and field. I know she played volleyball and she probably played other sports. I think she played touch football too somehow. I'm pretty sure that that was one of the sports that she played, but she played all kinds of sports that, you know, she, where she leveraged her very, you know, I mean, she has an Amazon build, you know, she's this beautiful, like, you know, fantastic vessel that she gets to inhabit at this particular time in history at, you know, as a teenager and as a young 20 year old woman, and she did not take it lightly. She used it for, you know, modeling, but also for athletics, you know, and, she, but this is, you know, not just a person with a body, it's someone who has a brain, you know, she had mm-hmm. a really, you know, the strategy of the game, how you, um, uh, you know, focus your mind against your opponents. She understood how to compete as an athlete. And so when she saw the opening at CBS NFL today, she then had to prove to these to everybody that she was a capable and competent sports caster. And so when I was doing my research there, the very first articles when she got the job and everything, they were so disrespectful to her. They were like, well, this is Jane Kennedy. She likes pizza and ice cream. Like they were trying to make it so that they were I mean, there was like a, I remember this picture and there was a, like a under, you know, the, the, um, the description underneath her picture obviously says her name and it's like, and her favorite thing is pizza and ice cream as if she's, you know, some child or something, you know, it was very disrespectful. And it was always just trying to paint both her and Phyllis George. Uh, Phyllis George is the first woman to become a sportscaster. And that's the position that Jane was going for. Phyllis George left uh, CBS NFL today. The position was open and then Jane went after uh, this, this new opportunity but the same exact attack on them being women and not having the mind to decipher football to then make predictions about football in terms of who might win and who might, you know, just the the analyst part. They weren't being hired to be analysts at all. They were just, they were hoping that they were hiring these women to be pretty faces. And that was that. And that was definitely the coverage for both Phyllis George and for Jane Kennedy um, Overton it was completely trying to make them into, um, objectify them and make it so that they were just pretty faces. And they were both pretty faces, you know, but they also, both of them had minds and both of them had analysis. And Jane um, ultimately, I had to, she had to endure so many things when it came to trying to prove that she understood the game of football and that she could predict, you know, who would win and why, like, you know, back up her prediction and, and, and justify it. So that was already from the gate, a very difficult thing for her to have to, um, to prove because of the way that they were, some people were depicting her in the media once they saw how beautiful she was. And that became, that was all that they wanted her to be. <laughs> they never wanted her to be anything more than that. And they were not interested in um, entertaining that she had some background that would, you know, lend itself to being an analyst. Yeah. Well, I thought she did a, a great job. I just heard her watching. I mean, I thought, I thought she was great. Mm-hmm. Um, you, we were talking about some of the tribulations she dealt with and, you know, without giving away too much of your film. Right. <laughs> uh, what are some that you can share with us that she she had to deal with that maybe surprised you? Because I know you probably had your own challenges. Oh, hundred percent. Obviously, yes. <laughs> yeah, but obviously, she, she faced must have been mind boggling. Yeah, so it's you know Jane's um, initial problem was in the audition, and in the audition it was it, you know there were not even a mix of blondes and brunettes. Everyone was blonde. Every single other woman out of seven, it was almost eighty women that they interviewed. It was about I think it was like seventy seven or seventy eight women that they interviewed, and they were almost at eighty. And every single one of them were blonde except for Jane Kennedy. Jane Kennedy is the only brunette, and she's also African American. So everyone was white and blonde, and she is exactly going the other direction. Uh, from everybody else. And so that alone was um, just letting her know that this was not 
they were not, she was not a part of this casting call. This was not a part of the breakdown of what they were looking for. And then in addition to that, the fact that they, when they did hire her, the phenotype of being a person of African descent is that you usually have, you know, tightly curled hair, you have curly hair. And so when she started to wear her hair in a more natural way, because as the seasons progress, it gets more humid and, you know, you can certainly, you can straighten your hair, but it does become more difficult to uh, straighten hair when, you know, the sun hits <laughs> and the humidity <laughs> follows. Um, and so, you know, she's traveling all over the country as well as internationally on behalf of uh, CBS Sports at this time. So she's going to places like Puerto Rico and she's going to Asia. I mean, she's going to other countries. I think the Olympics at the time, she went to another, I forgot where it was at the time, but I'm pretty sure it was in another, um, it was very far away. <laughs> it was uh, like in Tokyo. I'm trying, to think, yeah. trying to think about the Olympics, 70. Yeah, 78. I think 72 yeah. or 76 would have been Montreal. Well, she's okay. there in 78 to 1980. So she was covering the Olympics at one point, and then she was covering other like international games. And so she's, you know, coming back with her hair kinky and it's, you know, full and billowy and, and lovely. It's, you know, beautiful hair, but they were like, you know, all telephone calls were ringing off the hook that you could not wear your hair like this, you know, and this is not a phone call that anyone else is going to get. Um, and then none of her co-anchors are going to get that phone call about their natural texture of their hair and the color of their hair, the uh, male pattern baldness of their hair, you know, any of the things that are, <laughs> that are a part of everybody else's hair journey in life. This is a phone call that is just reserved for African-American women and sometimes I'm sure men who are on the air. And so this is this is one of these are some, several things that she endured, um, as well as just in, in general, having um, not being compensated uh, properly. And that um, is a big part of the film. And I don't want to give that away too much, but the compensation yeah. segment of the film, I always, whenever I'm watching the film with an audience, I hear gasps and I hear all types of, uh, you know, just people are astonished and and really hurt for her and and for the, the, the issue um, as a whole, you know, the idea of, of pay disparity on gender lines and racial lines, as well as I'm sure, you know, age, like ageism, I'm sure many different isms come into play when it comes to, um, to being compensated and depending on where you're hired, they, you know, you don't know how much other people are, are getting paid who are sitting right next to you. And you think they're your friends and you think that you're, you know, you, you build bonds with them and you all depend on each other to go forward. But the way that they compensated her was, you know, it, it was egregiously, you know, it was, it was, it, it was egregious, I think, you know, and that's the way most people feel just how atrocious, you know, how, how horrifying. I mean, it's like, it's like, right. it is they use horror like it's a horror film. I mean, to go to work every day and then be a direct descendant of American slaves, which is what African Americans are. And then you go and you're working and you find out that the amount of money that you're, you know, every job costs money to have. And the amount of money that you are making basically puts you in a position where you're not getting paid and you're working. And mm. that is the loose definition of slavery, you know? So, and that's exactly what she was um, eventually found out um, she was enduring and, it, and it, it hits everybody that particular part of the film everybody responds um I, i've never i've never actually watched the film without people letting out <laughs> some type of like emoting like why like i mean people talking to the screen you know they're laughing <laughs> at the right times they're crying at other times i mean i've got every type of emotion i try and I, I i intended it for i intended the film to have this roller coaster ride of emotion so that you could feel what she was feeling every time she stepped into the studio and tried to prove herself and prove herself and then you know, it's a, a popular phrase right now with this generation is like, oh, it's just so exhausting. It's so exhausting. And I'm like, you have no idea <laughs> what these people had to go through. Oh my gosh, you know, past generations have had to go through all of the things that new generations, you know, similar, similar trials and tribulations, things that are life-threatening, things that are, you know, taking, a, are, are making it so that you can't reach your ultimate potential in this lifetime. Either it's it's life-threatening in terms of your actual life or it's life-threatening in terms of your purpose. And both of those things um, suffer, you know, with all the diff with oppression that's prepared to, to you know, go, it has, has no limits. You know, there's no limits to the oppression. There's no tapping out. There's no crying uncle. It is, they, you know, people are out to destroy you and you still have to stand up against the machine. And Jane is a person who did that. And I think a lot of people feel that way in their personal lives. And they can connect with her. Yeah. In particular trial. And I think uh, I was looking up a little bit of your bio and stuff like that, and I started seeing the parallels with you, you and Jane. But you, you said you weren't a sports person. But can you talk about how you related, how you related to her? Because there are still a lot of parallels. And was 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 she a role model for you? 
Oh uh, yeah, she's more than a role model. So um, she's my cousin actually. So oh. <laughs> Jane is my cousin. So I knew the thing is that I didn't actually know her that well because she's my she's my mother's first cousin, right? So she's not my direct. You know, I didn't. I wasn't. I'm not in the same generation as her, obviously. And so she has. And she has a lot of cousins. There's a lot of cousins. Her mom. Her mom and dad both. I think are like one of like ten kids and eight kids. You know, there's a lot of. kids. <laughs> So she has a lot of cousins. She probably has a hundred, hundred first cousins. So it didn't mean that much that we were cousins, but we are cousins. And so when I, I knew probably around age nine that I was going to go into television, it was just, I didn't even know there were other careers to pursue, you know, it's like I'm going to be a TV personality. I'm going to, going to write stories. I just knew I was going to be a, some type of creative writer and I was going to make the, uh, the, I was, I wanted to capture the stories of people's lives and then elevate and exalt them, you know, so that it could be a story for other people who were lost and confused and didn't know which way to go. And that's what we use stories for. That's what we use stories, uh, religious, uh, uh, from religious books, as well, we use stories from the newspaper. That's what we use, you know, any, any type of story where it's trying to give us like what's behind door number one or two or three. And what do we do when we're in a situation? It's, it's giving us some type of um, path or avenue in addition to escapism. And so, yeah, she was certainly a role model. But the thing is, she wasn't on TV at the time that I was growing up. So I didn't actually experience this. What I did experience was all the people who were who had watched her on TV, just they would get this far away look in their eye. <laughs> they would just be like, Jane Kennedy. And they would just, and then they all, everyone has this story of like what Jane Kennedy meant to them. And I'm like, where is this legendary Jane Kennedy? You know, it was just like, where is she? You know, what, what uh, castle does she live in? You know, it was just... <laughs> I mean, everybody in my family, they would take all the Ebony and Jet magazines and push them to like one area of the house. You know, they were always in a very sacred space in the house. And, you know, you couldn't just like, you know, touch the magazine with greasy fingers or anything like that. Cause it was like Jane Kennedy was on the cover of Ebony or Jet. And so I do remember her being on Ebony and Jet, but at that point she was raising a, her own family. So I really didn't experience watching her on TV, but I knew that she was a big deal, you know, not that long ago. I knew that this was a a current event that she was famous, even though I just wasn't looking at it. So that was kind of like, it just piqued my curiosity. But then when I went into television news and I, I did follow her path, of going into beauty pageants. So I did compete in the Miss America competition and I was, you know, first runner up to Miss DC and I was in the Miss Black um, USA competition. I was first runner up to Miss Black USA. So I knew that that was the finishing school to being an on camera personality. And that was definitely directly related to both her and Vanessa Williams and, um, you know, uh, Debbie Turner Bell and other, other, you know, pageant type people who pursued that. And also Oprah. Oprah was also in pageants before she went on to do Oprah, Oprah type stuff. And, um, and then <laughs> Like uh, Holly Berry, Holly Berry was also in pageants. So when I I realized I had to do pageants, which was like one of the best things I ever did because I was all into like books and being smart, and I could care less about makeup and hair and clothes. Like what for what? Like you know, all the answers are in the books. I just want to get good scores on the SAT. But I didn't realize like there's other types of intelligence, and you have to be a person who understands how to you know adorn the aesthetic of your visage. You know, you have to decide how to. Um, you know, paint yourself so that, you know, the form and the function are, are working at, at the zenith, you know, you have to be attractive and then have some substance, you know, so I had worked on the substance, but I was, I, I was not uh, prepared. To, I didn't care. I did not care about hair and makeup or like waxing eyebrows. I'm like, get out of here for what? Just, yeah, I was very much like, I don't know. I guess I was a feminist. I don't know what I, I don't know if there's a philosophical <laughs> base, but then I had to definitely turn into some, you know, Barbie esque uh, type of thing, but it was worth it. You know, it, at that point you do practice the skill set to be a TV personality. And eventually, of course, I studied film and television production, all of that. And I, you know, went in every direction that you can go from producing talk shows to being a TV anchor reporter to making fiction film to working with Spike Lee and you know John Singleton and Casey Lemons and Ali Garim and all these great you know directors who are making fiction uh, feature films so I just wanted to be a wanted to be adept at making all types of stories and this is you know one of many stories that I want to tell but this particular one has always meant a great deal to me because she's so dynamic I mean it's just I don't know what Jane Kennedy hasn't done, you know, with the first, I guess, like, you know, 35 years of her life, she had, she pretty much had lived, I think, 10 lifetimes, you know, 10 different career pursuits. And mm -hmm. without any connections, without knowing, you know, having any, I mean, just showing up and just, you know, somehow put persevering and catching people's attention and then convincing them to 
put all their chips on her, you know, place that bet because she's a good investment. And I think that's really beautiful. The fact that, I mean, everything that she got from Rowan and Martin's laughing, you know, to the Dean Martin show, she didn't know anybody. She just jumped in the car from Ohio and drove to Los Angeles and just went for auditions or, or just showed up on the, probably just showed up at the studio. <laughs> Like, you know, just wandered the halls until she found the right place. So and she had a job as like a secretary. Like she was, a, you know, I think she was a typist or something like that. I mean, she had a job that was way across town. I know she had this job, I think, where she was some type of administrative assistant person. And the audition was, she only had like an hour lunch break and it was an hour away. And so she knew she was going to lose her job if she went to the audition. And she went to the audition. You know, it was yeah. like she was a, a very, very much a risk taker, but also you know, always, rec always really believed in herself, just really believed that this is what she was supposed to do. And I mean, she left when she was like 18, 19 years old. I mean, she was a teenager when she pursued this. And, you know, she, I think she capitalized off of the fact that, you know, you feel like you're invincible and, and I, and she put all her, you know, all her energy into taking flight. And she did very, very quickly and very rapidly. And, um, and, it, and then when she it met adversity, she has a great philosophy. Like her philosophy is something that I always, I, I just think that whatever you're doing in life, whatever your career field is, that philosophy that she has is what I really wanted to come across in the film is that she just, it's a, it's a, certainly a never give up attitude, but it is very much a never give up because this is, um, you don't know what's in, just around the corner. Like this may seem like, you know, devastation and loss, but if you just keep pushing and, you know, the world is also, is, is also moving towards you, like, you know, opportunity is walking towards you as you're walking towards it. But if you're, if you stay stagnant, then, you know, you won't cross paths with the next big thing. And I think that that's really, you know, she's a, she's just a very, very, um, not just driven person, but very spiritual person and a very loving person. I mean, she really, you know, invests so much love into her family, her, her family she was born to, the family that she created, as well as um, the, the community of people that have supported her and loved her. Um, and she loves them back. I mean, that's very much the case. She, you know, you could feel it. I mean, she just makes, she makes other people feel so um welcomed and warm and that's that's really what people are responding to when they meet her so you know she has a great in, um, emotional intelligence <laughs> and that's what makes her a great tv host it makes her a great at a lot of things but um you know people feel like they that jane thinks they're great too you know that's the way she makes people feel now you uh we talked about it before we recorded that you helped get jane on the pregame for the super bowl can you talk about that whole process and, and the Sure. Kudos for doing that. That's such a great thing because it was great to see Brent and her together again. And yeah, and they um so they actually reunited during the pandemic. So during the pandemic, unfortunately, we lost Irv Cross and we also lost Phyllis George during that 2020 uh, to 2021 era of time. And so the two remaining hosts of CBS NFL today are now Brent Musburger and Jane Kennedy. Those are the only two people remaining. He's in his early 80s, you know, and, you know, so he's the oldest member out of all of the all of them. And he has a radio show in Las Vegas. And so also during the pandemic, they did reunite. They reunited on his radio show in Las Vegas, which was wonderful. And, you know, Jane is great at reuniting with people in general. And so back in um, the summer, I wrote to CBS. And I was like, listen, you know, you all have the, you have the you are credited with having the first African American woman be a sportscaster on your show, and this is a really big deal. Like you're on the right side of history. Um, however, you know her experience wasn't the best experience, and I just wrote them. I was like, you know, this would be wonderful to you know bring her back and to bring her you know on some type of future program. And so you know they didn't notify me that that was the case, but then the next thing you know she was um, she and Brent were brought back on to host the pregame show, which was at one o'clock right before the Super Bowl, which was the most watched Super Bowl in American history. What? Amazing. Like, I was so happy that that is the stage that, you know, Jane got to, uh, you know, and she was able to tell her story. She was able to tell what happened and, you know, really go through the feelings in front of the most watched broadcast in the history of uh, American football, Super Bowl football. And she, um, you know, was able to reunite with Brent and Brent was rooting for her from the beginning, you know, from the very beginning of, of seeing her audition, he was rooting for her. So, you know, their friendship was, um, re, you know, they reconnected and they reconnected. This is the second time that I'm aware of that they reconnected from when they, um, you know, came together, but I don't, and I'm not sure if they saw how often they saw each other in between, you know, 1980 and uh, probably the year 2020. I mean, I'm not exactly sure if, if they saw each other or if they, but I know that they definitely reconnected in 2020. And then this is, would be the second time since then on, te on television or on broadcast. So, yeah, I mean, I definitely, I'm, I'm really, I mean, I know there's a really big popular thing right now to say, oh, you know, we got to give people their flowers. And I'm like, you got to reinstate 
what was taken from me. <laughs> That's what we need to be doing is trying to get people back, um, you know, get the things back that were taken from the baby boomer generation of people who they're here, you know, they're here now. And there were all kinds of wrongs done to people who were born in the greatest generation and the baby boomer generation, and of course, subsequent generations. But if there is a way to restore what was taken, then let's do that. I don't, you know, I'm not a big fan of handing out flowers to people who deserve money, you know, who deserve <laughs> recognition, who deserve, you know, their name in the hall of fame or whatever the right thing is to do. Let's do the right thing instead of handing out, you know, flowers. Um, and, and I understand the sentiment means well, but it isn't really proper compensation for people who deserved to be, to, you know, have, um, the spoils of their labor and their energy and their work realized. You know, they, mm -hmm. they didn't get that. And, and there's still time on the clock to do it. Uh, we're running out of time, but I want to go just really quick because you mentioned this really quickly. And, and I'm a fan of Spike Lee and uh, John Singleton. Can you, talk, can you talk about what movies you worked on with them and, and that experience sure. really quickly? Yes. Okay. So I went to NYU Film School and Spike Lee is a professor there. He's been a professor there for a very you know, long time. And he's a wonderful professor. And John Singleton also did workshops and Casey Lemons also works there and she did workshops as well. And also I went to Howard University and studied under Haile Karima. But with Spike Lee, I had a good fortune of working with him on When the Levees Broke, which was about oh. the Hurricane Katrina um, disaster in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana. And so he and he did bring me in also to do um, ADR work. I had to replace some dialogue and he's like, you're from the South, right? And I'm like, I'm from Philadelphia. But and he's like, well, you think you're from the South? And I'm like, OK, whatever gets me the job. <laughs> I'll be from the South. So, you know, I mean, I definitely can do voiceover and all of that. So I had to go replace, I did some ADR work and that was, you know, that was my first Spike Lee credit. I just remember, you know, being so excited and like calling my family, like it's happening. Like I'm in a Spike Lee movie. Oh, you know, like I, it was like any little small thing that happened that my little, my childhood version of me was excited. I was like, ah, this, this is all I ever needed. I've lived, you know, like this is all. And so I was, and I remember he got me like a salad and a Snapple. And I was like, I will never wash this. I will hold on to this forever. This will be in my refrigerator, you know, till the, my, my last day on earth. Like, you know, I was just like this Snapple. Spike Lee bought me a Snapple. Like I was just so thrilled. But, um, but he, yeah, he brought us down to do that film and it was so impressive. And I also did the behind the scenes footage for, I shot some of the, um, like the making of, it was me and this other mm -hmm. camera person and on, for my shift, we we shot the making of. And I remember we were walking into this house because I was like, I'm going to get shots that no one knows. And then Spike yelled like way down the way. He was like, what are you doing? There's black mold in there. Get out of there. And I was like, what? Like, you know, he's always aware of you. And I'm thinking over, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm going to get these shots inside of this house. And it was, you know, he's like you're trying to make sure I don't get like black lung disease or something. You know, he was, he was looking out for me. So. But Spike is like, Spike notices everything and he is so helpful and he will help you, you know, achieve your wildest film dreams. Um, so he's, you know, he's, it's, it's a dream come true to have worked with him at all. And I did a commercial, there was a, a surge commercial and I met a lot of my actors on his commercial. So I was making a second, my second year of film and I, I met all these people on set and I, they were extras and I was like, I can tell that you can act like, you know, I'm his PA and, you know, like I was like trying to sell like the whole. And I'm like, you know, just, just come and be in my film, you know, and then, they, and they were, and they were fantastic and their career, you know, was launched because we were both, I was a PA and they were an extra. And then they went on to do other things. Like Rome Kondo was one of my actors and he was an extra and that he became the first Asian American game show host in America. Oh. But his, yeah, and he was in, he was in one, he was in my second year film, but he was an extra on Spike set. So I found all these really wonderful, you know, actors and actresses from working with Spike and. Yeah. And he's just, he's so much fun. He's just a fun person to watch do everything that he does. It's, it's like no other set. And then he makes brilliant work that is, you know, iconic and, and, un and uniquely um, documents the American, American history, you know, in a way that only Spike Lee can. So yeah, that was, I, I loved working with him. And then John Singleton was making um, Black Snake Moan at the time when I was in grad oh. school. So I remember, you know, that part, that time period as well. Yeah. Great, great. Great NYU experiences, <laughs> you know, they have the, the best people all the time. And I mean, I, I have like a box of notes from going to grad school. I mean, I was just take, I would just write everything down. Like any, they were like, oh, he's wearing red eye argyle socks. Write that down. Like, I was like <laughs> whatever they did, I'm like, I got to get red argyle socks. I got to do exactly what Spike Lee does in order to make it. So. <laughs> we need to set up a new uh, NYU group because I've interviewed a few NYU people too. Uh, so we have a lot of them. With films here. I, know. I know. Well, you guys all do excellent work. Well, we 
I would talk to you even longer. Unfortunately, uh, we're running out of time. Sophia, a delight. Thank you so much for sharing. Like I said, I, um, I'll share a quick story though. But when I heard you doing this story, when I started off as a sports journalist, I was like struggling and I didn't think I was going to, uh, I thought I was going to walk away from my career. And then I saw Michael Kim on a sports center. The first time I saw an Asian face there. And then I mm -hmm. suck it out. I got my job in Palm Springs. And I was able to fulfill a lot of my career goals. And it reminds me of a Billie Jean quote that if you can see it, you can be it. And so when I heard about this Jane Kennedy story, that's what I put oh, my mind. So I'm so I happy. I can't wait to share that with her. That is just, I mean, that's beautiful. That's exactly, yeah, that's what I want. That's exactly the <laughs> vision of all this. And it's worth it. It's worth all the pain and suffering to be the first face because you inspire so many other people. You put starch in their backbone, you know? Yeah. And they're ready to stand at their full height. She's an important part of our American history, sports mm -hmm. journalism history, drill, history, everything. Mm -hmm. And I hope this film puts her in that proper place yeah. because I she's an important her. figure. That's my goal. I want to restore everything that was, that was, you know, that was taken from her or lost or, you know, thought it could never be re re regained. But um, I'm, I'm going to put all my, my life, blood and energy into getting all that back for her and many other people. Well, that sounds great. Thank you so much, Sophia. Again, uh, March 21st to 25th, you'll see some fantastic stories. Uh, just like uh, Jane, <clears throat> Jane Kennedy. Um, tickets are going quick, so please uh, get on there and start buying your tickets. And uh, remember, Sean Penn for opening night guest. Oh, wow. So uh, we look forward to seeing you all. And oh, yeah. uh, again, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. you, you... I love Sean. Oh. I'm fangirling. I'm sorry. I'm fangirling. Let me just know you. <laughs> I'm trying hard not to fanboy on him as well. That's so wonderful. Sophia, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. And again, looking forward to your film. Thank you so much. Great interview. Thank you very much.